Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. I'm a 33-year-old woman who's always struggled with back pain and posture issues due to my large chest. It's been a constant source of discomfort, affecting everything from my daily activities to my sleep. After years of dealing with this, I finally decided to undergo breast reduction surgery. It wasn't an easy decision, but my doctor assured me it would significantly improve my quality of life. The surgery went well, but recovery has been tough. Everything hurts, and I'm super sensitive to things I used to take for granted. Even a small bump in the road while driving feels like someone's punching me in the chest. Standing for too long? Forget about it. It's like my body's screaming at me to sit down. So two weeks after my surgery, it's my partner's birthday. I felt terrible that I couldn't do much to celebrate, so I suggested we go to our favorite diner for breakfast. It's not much, but at least I could treat him to a nice meal. We arrive at the diner, and it's packed. The waiting area is tiny, and there's only one chair by the door, which I gratefully sink into. My partner stands next to me, and we wait our turn. The hostess explains that it's a first come first served system and the closer you are to the door the sooner you get seated all right fair enough we've been waiting for about 15 minutes when two older couples walk in they're probably in their early 70s and they look a bit chilly from the cold outside now normally i'd offer my seat in a heartbeat but today i just can't my chest is already starting to ache from the drive over one group near the door gets called for their table and everyone starts shuffling forward. That's when things get interesting. These older folks immediately plop themselves down on the newly vacated bench near the door, completely oblivious to the fact that they've just cut in line. A few of us try to explain the system politely. We're all smiles, no aggression, just trying to clear up the confusion. But then, this one lady in the group, let's call her Karen. She's not having any of it. Karen loudly declared that we should let her friend sit because of her age. She gave me this nasty look, like I've personally offended her by existing in that chair. Then she rolled her eyes and shook her head at her friend, as if to say we should all be ashamed of ourselves. Another family waiting with us tries to explain again, but Karen's on a roll. She rudely said she didn't care about our system and that they should get priority because they're older. At this point, I'm getting uncomfortable. Not just because of the situation, but because my chest is starting to really hurt from the tension. I decide to speak up. I apologized and explained that I would have given up my seat, but I was recovering from surgery and couldn't stand for long periods. I apologized again, feeling awkward. The waiting area goes dead quiet. You could hear a pin drop. Karen looks at me, then at her friend, then back at me. For a second, I think she might actually understand. But nope. Karen started to suggest that I might want to sit somewhere else, but I cut her off before she could finish. I politely declined, saying I was fine where I was. We all wait in awkward silence after that. I can feel Karen's eyes boring into me, probably trying to figure out what kind of surgery I had. Sorry, lady, but my medical history is none of your business. Finally, it's our turn to be seated. As we walk past Karen and her group, I hear her mutter something about young people today and their lack of respect. I bite my tongue, resisting the urge to turn around and give her a piece of my mind. Once we're seated, my partner reaches across the table and squeezes my hand. He asked if I was okay. I replied that I was, but expressed my frustration with people's behavior. We try to enjoy our breakfast, but I can't shake off the encounter. It's not just about Karen and her entitlement. It's about all the people who judge others without knowing their story. I may look fine on the outside. Heck, I even put on makeup in a cute outfit today. But that doesn't mean I'm not struggling. When we were leaving, I spot Karen and her group just being seated. She catches my eye and has the audacity to look offended. That's when I decide I've had enough. I walk over to their table, ignoring the twinge in my chest. I politely address them, explaining that they didn't know me or my situation. I told them I had just had major surgery and... While I might look fine, I was in a lot of pain. I suggested that next time, instead of assuming the worst about people, 
they should try asking politely if they need something. I added that they might be surprised at how willing people are to help when approached with kindness. I don't wait for her response. I turn and walk out, leaving Karen and her friends in stunned silence. It's a small victory, but it feels pretty good. I'm a high school junior with pretty severe asthma. It's been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. Most days I manage it fine with my inhaler, but sometimes things get rough. Last month we got a new teacher for our biology class. Right from day one she rubbed me the wrong way. Always going on about how strict she was and how we needed to respect her authority. I tried to keep my head down and just get through the class. On this one day, I woke up feeling a bit off. My chest was tight and I knew it might be a rough one. I made sure to bring my inhaler to school just in case. When I settled into my seat for biology class, I could feel my breathing getting worse. About halfway through the lesson, I realized I needed my inhaler. I raised my hand trying to get the teacher's attention. I politely asked if I could step out for a moment, but the teacher refused, saying she was in the middle of an important lesson. I explained that I needed to use my inhaler because I was having trouble breathing, but she dismissed my concerns, telling me not to be dramatic and to pay attention to the lesson. My breathing was getting worse by the second, and she wouldn't let me use my inhaler. I tried again, emphasizing that it was really important and explaining that I had asthma and needed my inhaler right away. The teacher, however, told me to stop disrupting the class, insisting that if I could talk, I could breathe. By this point, I was starting to panic. My chest felt like it was in a vice, and I could hear myself wheezing. My classmates were looking worried, but no one dared to speak up against the teacher. I decided I had no choice. I reached into my bag to grab my inhaler. As soon as I pulled it out, the teacher stormed over to my desk. She demanded to know what I thought I was doing, reminding me that she had told me no. Before I could react, she snatched the inhaler out of my hand and shoved it in her desk drawer. She told me I could have it back after class and ordered me to pay attention. I tried to stand up to leave the room, but my legs felt weak. The room was starting to spin. I could hear my classmates shouting, but it all sounded far away. The next thing I remember clearly is waking up in the hospital. My parents were there, looking worried sick. They told me I'd had a severe asthma attack and had been rushed to the emergency room by ambulance. When I was feeling a bit better, I told them what had happened. To say they were furious would be an understatement. My dad looked like he was ready to march down to the school right then and there. In the next few days, my parents met with the principal, the school board, and even a lawyer. It turned out that denying a student access to their inhaler wasn't just mean, it was illegal. The teacher tried to defend herself, saying she thought I was just trying to get out of class. But between my classmates' accounts and the school security footage, there was no denying what had happened. In the end, the teacher was fired. The school board couldn't risk keeping someone so negligent on staff, but my parents didn't stop there. They pushed for changes to make sure this never happened to another student. The school implemented a new policy. All staff had to undergo training about common medical conditions and how to respond to emergencies. They also put up posters in every classroom explaining students' rights to access their medication. I missed a week of school recovering, but when I came back, things were different. My classmates treated me like some kind of hero for standing up to the teacher, even though I hadn't really done anything. The new biology teacher was great, understanding and always willing to listen to students' concerns. I guess the lesson here is, if you see someone else in trouble, speak up. You never know. You might just save a life. Being four years older than my sister, I watched her tantrums, her demands, and her manipulations. Our parents, bless their hearts, tried their best to curb her behavior, but somehow she always managed to get her way. As we grew older, the gap between us widened. I focused on my studies, got a stable job, and started a family early. By the time I was 28, I had two beautiful children, a son and a daughter. My son, now 13, has always been special to me. When he was born, I gave him an unusual name, one that I had loved since I was a teenager. It was unique, meaningful, and perfect for my little boy. My sister, on the other hand, took a different path. 
She jumped from job to job, relationship to relationship, always chasing the next big thing that would make her feel important. It wasn't until she hit 30 that she finally settled down and got pregnant. When she announced her pregnancy, I was genuinely happy for her. Despite our differences, I hoped that becoming a mother would help her grow and mature. Little did I know what was coming. About a month before her due date, we had a family dinner. That's when she dropped the bomb. My sister casually mentioned that she had decided on a name for her son. When I asked what it was, she revealed that she had chosen the same name as my son. I was shocked and felt like I'd been punched in the gut. The table went silent and all eyes turned to me. I pointed out that it was my son's name. My sister brushed it off, saying it was a great name and that she had always loved it. When I suggested it might be confusing, she dismissed my concerns, arguing that she didn't own the name and that people would know which child they were talking about since my son was older. My parents tried to intervene, but my sister brushed them off with her usual flair for drama. She accused us all of ganging up on her and insisted that it was her baby and she could name him whatever she wanted. The dinner ended on a sour note, with my sister storming out and the rest of us sitting in awkward silence. Over the next few weeks, I tried to reason with her, but she wouldn't budge. She accused me of being selfish and trying to ruin her special moment. That's when I decided to change tactics. If she wanted to play this game, I could play it too. I started calling every family member, every mutual friend, even old acquaintances from high school. I gushed about how my sister was naming her baby after my son, expressing how touched and honored I felt. I emphasized how it showed how much she loved and respected our family. At first, people were confused. But as I kept spreading this narrative about how amazing and thoughtful my sister was, word started to spread. Soon, everyone was congratulating her on her sweet gesture of naming her son after her nephew. The final straw came at her baby shower. When she opened gifts, each card and message praised her for her selfless decision to honor her nephew. I could see her getting more and more agitated. Finally, she exploded. She loudly declared that she wasn't naming her son after anyone and that it was her choice and her name. I pretended to be confused, asking if she didn't love the name because of how special it was to our family. And if that wasn't the reason she chose it, she realized she was cornered. Either admit she was copying my son's name out of spite or go along with the narrative that she was doing it out of love for her nephew. Neither option appealed to her narcissistic nature. A week later, she announced she had changed her mind about the name. She'd found something even more unique and special for her son. I nodded and smiled, knowing I had won this battle. It begins when I helped out a new hire who got stung by a bee. I had everything she needed right at my desk. Antihistamines, ointment, you name it. From that day on, the nickname stuck. Work mom. Let me give you a little backstory on how I ended up here. I studied psychology in college, thinking I'd go into counseling. But during an internship at a local business, I discovered my knack for problem solving and organization. That's how I fell into quality assurance. It might not be therapy, but let me tell you, it requires just as much patience and people skills. I've been with this company for seven years now. When I started, the quality assurance department was a mess. No one knew what they were supposed to be doing, deadlines were missed left and right, and don't even get me started on the filing system. It was like walking into a tornado of paperwork. I rolled up my sleeves and got to work. I created new systems, streamlined processes, and somehow managed to get everyone on board. It wasn't easy, but I've always had a way of bringing people together. Before long, our department was running like a well-oiled machine. That's probably why I ended up becoming the unofficial work mom. I was always prepared, always ready to help, and always had a solution up my sleeve. Need a band-aid? Check my drawer. Forgot your lunch? I've got granola bars. Computer acting up? Let me take a look. Now I work in quality assurance, and a big part of our job is doing quarterly audits. Most of the time, it's smooth sailing, but when there are issues, we create these things called data sheets. They're basically to-do lists for teams that need to fix something. There's this one team across the hole 
that's a real pain in the neck when it comes to these data sheets. Getting them to respond or update us on their progress is like pulling teeth. But the worst of the bunch is this guy I'll call Nick Beard. Picture the World of Warcraft guy from South Park, and you've got him pegged. One day my colleague, let's call her G, went over to their lab to see if she could help with their outstanding data sheets. G's a sweetheart, always trying to lend a hand and make connections. She even brought some Halloween candy from the cauldron I keep at my desk. Yeah, I'm kind of the office witch. Sue me. G told me later what went down. G greeted everyone cheerfully, offering candy and asking if anyone wanted help with their data sheets. The team grabbed the candy, but then Neckbeard, without even looking up, waved his hand dismissively and told G to go away in a rude manner. The whole team, including G's friend who works there, burst out laughing. G, thinking it was a joke, nervously chuckled along. She then asked if Neckbeard was serious, to which he rudely confirmed that he didn't need her help complained about everyone pressuring him about the data sheets, and dismissed her again. G came back to our cube, told me what happened, and started packing up to work from home. I was fuming. You don't mess with my work, kids. Here's where Neckbeard royally screwed up. I'm in charge of tracking data sheet progress and sending weekly emails to the teams and their higher-ups. Neckbeard's data sheets? They were about to be two years late. Our new manager had been praising the improved communication between teams, thanks to my tracking sheet. And get this, Neckbeard had the audacity to lie to our manager, saying he was almost done with the data sheets and in active communication with our team. I took a deep breath, walked over to our quality assurance lead, and filled him in. Then I went to our supervisor, who had just come out of a meeting about Neckbeard's team and their outstanding data sheets. One look at my face, and he knew something was up. Our supervisor asked me what was wrong, sensing my distress. I told him he wouldn't believe what had just happened. I then explained the entire situation, and our supervisor immediately started drafting an email to our manager and Neckbeard supervisor. A few days later, I got the update on what was happening to Neckbeard and his team. It was pretty satisfying. 1. Their work from home privileges revoked. 2. They now have to be in the office during specific hours. For context, we usually have flexible hours. 3. All their planned time off? Rejected. 4. Oh, and they're all getting written up. This will probably mess with any future raises they might have gotten. But it doesn't end there. Remember how I mentioned I'm good at problem solving? Well, I decided to take it a step further. I proposed a new interdepartmental training program focused on communication and teamwork. Guess who's going to be the first team to go through it? That's right, Neckbeard and his merry band of jerks. The cherry on top, G's so-called friend who laughed at her came by, looking for her after the incident. He must have realized he messed up. He asked me if G was still in the office. With a sweet smile, I told him that she had left. He cursed under his breath and scurried back to their lab. I may be the work mom but I'm not afraid to dish out some tough love when needed. And let me tell you, watching Neckbeard and his team squirm through sensitivity training for the next month, that's going to be sweeter than any Halloween candy. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.